Welcome everyone. So we're gonna start uh, our uh, first session of the afternoon and uh, our next speaker uh, will be Professor Mohammed Abdullah. He's representing WTRT Emirates, uh, representing the uh, hosted at the University of uh, Sharjah. He's gonna present uh, the strategic assessment and optimization of waste to energy project. So uh, I'm gonna give uh, the floor to uh, Professor uh, Mohammed Abdullah. Well, first of all, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, we really appreciate. So, and uh, I give you the floor straight away. Thank you. Uh, I know you guys are full and uh, I'll try to catch your attention as much as possible. Uh, my name is Mohammed Abdullah and I'm the head of uh, WTRT in uh, Emirates or the United Arab Emirates, uh, for UAE for uh, short. Uh, I'll give you first a, a quick introduction about myself. Uh, I work as an associate professor in the University of Sharjah, Department of Civil and Environmental. I'm also the program coordinator there for the Environmental Science and Engineering program. Uh, I'm a junk professor at the University of Ottawa, Canada, and a technical expert for the Federal Greenhouse Gas Offset Credit System in uh, Canada. Uh, my research interests, uh, not mm -hmm. only waste to energy, I do life cycle assessment, circular economy, and I do also artificial intelligence and smart cities. Uh, pretty, uh, um, I work on most of the hot topics uh, in, in today's, uh, uh, all the buzzwords in, in, in today's research and, and technology. Um, and this is my uh, timeline uh, since I graduated in 2004 uh, till today. So I put a, a little agenda so that you have a, a little bit of connection between the parts of my presentation. I'll start to talk about the Emirates as a country uh, for the energy and waste profile. I will also uh, talk about existing and planned uh, waste to energy projects in the UAE. Uh, and then I'll take it to, uh, to, 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 to talk about the research that we had in the background along with uh, this development in the country. So I'll talk about the assessment. At, at this level, I don't talk about experimental research. I'll focus on the strategic assessment. So strategic assessment of waste to energy plants and the optimization of waste to energy plants. And I will conclude with a very important part, which is a, a software that we developed based on the um, cumulative knowledge that we uh, uh, built up through uh, those years. Um, so first of all, uh, the United Arab Emirates is a federation of seven emirates. Of course, the most famous one uh, to all of you is Dubai, uh, to the level that people, they don't know that it's part of a country. They, and I, and I, myself, when I present myself, I say I'm from Dubai. It's easier to get them from the emirates. So Dubai is actually the most populous, of course, and the most famous, but also Abu Dhabi is, uh, is the capital, the richest, and uh, you've seen it, of course, in one or two movies, Hollywood movies. So Mission Impossible, Fast and Furious, these are all filmed, or parts of them are, uh, are filmed in uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, Sharjah, where I come from, is uh, a place for uh, the culture hub of the UAE and the place of the largest university, which is my university. Um, the population is only 10 million. And I say 10 million, only 10 million, because I understand that it's less than the population of Hangzhou itself. Uh, but uh, look at the other number, the GDP or the gross domestic uh, product of the UAE is three times the average globally. So uh, each person would uh, have a contribution of 45,000 uh, US dollars. Um, the UAE is ranked 11th uh, of the largest energy consumers and over 90% of that is coming from fossil fuels, mostly natural gas. Uh, they actually depend less on oil uh, in, when, uh, with respect to their energy mix. And, and you can see the growth of renewable energy going up until it reached 9% in 2022. Um, on, the, on, the, on the bad side, uh, the UAE is uh, number four uh, globally on uh, carbon footprint, per capita carbon footprint. And uh, the, the most uh, contributing sectors uh, to the carbon footprint of the UAE is mostly the transportation. The car ownership is huge in the UAE. Um, even the composition of the fleet itself is, is quite unique. Uh, the energy, air conditioning, of course, temperatures going up to 50 and above. Uh, you cannot live without air conditioning. 
uh, and desalination also, because there is a lack of fresh water entirely in this region. So they depend on the very energy intensive uh, water desalination. Um, third, industrial process. And number four is uh, the waste. Um, so the UAE has a vision, has a very ambitious vision that by 2050, they will reach the, the net zero target. And each one of the Emirates uh, pledged to have certain uh, savings in terms of the water, the power, uh, how is the, they compose their energy, or, or basically their energy mix, uh, to reach or to cut 70% of the greenhouse gases from uh, power uh, generation by 2050. When it comes to the waste management, as I said, it's one of the major contributors to the carbon footprint of the country. And uh, the waste generation in the UAE is 2.1 kilograms, one of the highest in the world, uh, 2.1 kilograms per person per day. Um, the country has plans uh, to, uh, to maximize diversion, of course, from landfill. And the way to go with that, of course, is through material and energy uh, recovery. And uh, they have, either constructed or under development plans uh, of waste to energy plants um, to expand its global renewable energy portfolio to over 100 uh, gigawatts by 2030. Now, I want to show you also the waste composition of the UAE. This is a typical waste composition in most Middle Eastern country, plus or minus 5 to 10 percent. So uh, as other developing countries, of course, the organic fraction is the highest out of all fractions. But also a quarter of it is paper and 20% uh, oh. is, when you look at this waste composition, any waste to energy expert will just say, yeah, there is a, a, an opportunity there. Uh, well, actually two opportunities, one on the side of the food fraction. So biochemical conversion of the waste is very feasible or look feasible. And uh, the high plastic and paper uh, fractions will also uh, promote the thermochemical uh, conversion. Um, so this is uh, like the basis of our discussion today, uh, uh, talking about the UAE as a country and the uh, profiles of the waste. Now I'll, I'll take you through the projects first, and then we talk about the research behind uh, uh, those projects. So as I said, uh, Sharjah is the third most populous, uh, 2.3 million tons uh, annually. Um, the claimed uh, diversion rate right now is 76%. This is even before the waste to energy plant. Um, and the target of Sharjah, so uh, Sharjah is the leading emirate in the UAE when it comes to waste management. And the reason behind that is that they have a, a very famous company in the Middle East, BIA, and those are very, very well developed. It started as a government company and then uh, became uh, privatized and now it's a holding company. Um, they aim to have Sharjah as a zero waste city uh, by 2050. Um, so the first waste treatment, uh, waste to energy plant in the UAE has already been built and opened and in operation. And it was built in, along with Mazdar. Now Mazdar is a very key uh, um, entity in, uh, in, in the UAE because it is the, uh, the investment arm of the country in Abu Dhabi. So they invest in all renewable uh, projects, renewable energy projects, and they invest in over 40 countries. It's not only in the UAE, that's Muslim. So in bar partnership with BIA, they built the country's first commercial waste to energy plant. And I think it's the first in the region. There is one in Qatar, but this is the first commercial uh, one. Uh, and they process non-recycled waste because they have a very uh, large uh, material recovery facility in Sharjah as well. Uh, I'll play you that uh, at this side. It all started with the vision of zero waste. <laughs> Following the UAE's 2021 vision for a sustainable environment and infrastructure, BIA and Mazdar came together to build the Sharjah Waste to Energy Facility. The plant will play a key role in making Sharjah the first facility in the Middle East to achieve zero waste to landfill. Spanning an area of 80,000 square meters, the Sharjah Waste to Energy Facility will process waste at a rate of over 37.5 tons per hour and more than 300,000 tons annually. 
In addition to displacing almost 450,000 tons of CO2 emissions and saving 45 million cubic meters of natural gas every year, the plant will generate up to 30 megawatts of clean energy and power up to 28,000 homes. This is only the beginning. This is only one plant, and this is just a taste of what possibilities lie ahead. All right, so the second uh, waste to energy project, but this one is still under development or discussions, I would say, uh, things in the Middle East or in the UAE specifically would take a lot of time at the preparation stage. And when they decide to do it, it happens uh, momentarily. Uh, so this has been for uh, a couple of years uh, to uh, build a waste to hydrogen plant, uh, processing non-recycled plastics and, and waste food, uh, waste wood. Um, in, in terms of Dubai, I rank them Sharjah, Dubai, uh, Abu Dhabi, because Sharjah already has a built one and it's operating. Dubai uh, will open the first one this year, and this is how things go in the UAE. Uh, one emirate would do it, and then everyone would try to beat the, uh, Dr. Hani, I think, understand what I mean, uh, try to beat the, the, the other emirate, which is really good because it's for the benefit of the environment of the other. Yeah. Um, so Dubai, uh, in 2021, they pledged $20 million to do an integrated waste management uh, uh, system. Uh, that's a huge investment. And partially, this of course cover collection as well, but it's partial, uh, uh, part of that will be spent in waste to energy. Um, so this is the plan that they, will, uh, that they are actually building right now, and it will open at the end of this year or early 2024, and it can generate 20, uh, 215 megawatt hour uh, serving 135,000 households. Um, this is something interesting. Um, it's a project uh, that I also was part uh, of. Um, and this is uh, one of the largest dairy farms in the Middle East. It's called the Rawabi. And, um, and they actually built the first uh, full-scale anaerobic digestion plant uh, in the Middle East. There is a lot of small scale ones, but this is the first uh, I, relatively full scale uh, plant uh, converting 200 tons of different organic waste. And for Arawabi, they don't only process manure, but they also process expired milk, expired juice, every waste, organic waste that they produce within their facility. Um, it would generate 1.3 megawatt hour of, uh, of electrical energy and 10 tons of uh, concentrated organic fertilizer from the anaerobic digestion process. Uh, last but not least, Abu Dhabi. Uh, uh, it's the capital of the UAE. Um, and Abu Dhabi uh, plans to expand the renewable energy portfolio by 400% in the last uh, decade, or they, uh, this is what they did in the last decade. Um, and they aim to increase the renewable energy supply by 25% by 2030. The plant that they are uh, going to build, it's under development now, is the largest of the three of them. It has a capacity of 900,000 tons, diverting 75% of the waste from landfills. Um, so this is, um, the reason I wanted to show this timeline is to show you the decision-making process uh, in, in the UAE. So uh, whatever is in gray, I don't know if it's very clear, but those are uh, when the idea came and we started to see it in the newspapers and, and online. And, and then when uh, and it takes, for example, the waste to energy plant in Sharjah, the first mention of it is in 2017. It was operated this year. It takes time to, to make things uh, a reality. But then when they started building, they finish it in a couple of years. Um, all right, so alongside, I'll, I'll switch to the research part, my, my interesting part of the project, uh, of the presentation. Um, so along with this, we started around, around the same time, and we are one of the very, very few pro uh, groups in the UAE that works in waste management. It's, it's not the only one. Um, we started at 2018 with an assessment of the financial feasibility of a waste to energy projects, very high level, at the strategic level, we wanted just to see if it is feasible or not. 
Uh, and then we started to work in the lab. We switched to life cycle assessment. It's a, it's a, it's a good dimension of every assessment. And then we did uh, multi-criteria optimization. I'll tell you the story of this and how this led uh, one after another uh, of those projects. Um, this year, we got a, a, a very um, a, a contract with the Ministry of the Environment to design their uh, the strategic organic waste management for the entire country. Uh, so this is a, a, a very good project. It will last for a year to put them the strategies, which technologies that they should uh, lead uh, when it, uh, when it uh, comes to the treatment of organic waste. And at the end, I'll show you also the, the, the software. Uh, all right, so we start with the financial assessment. As I said, this is five years ago. So uh, that was when it was at the planning uh, stage. Um, so in this research, we uh, 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 designed uh, uh, an integrated plan. And, and that was the first research paper to actually look at the things from early at the collection level as well. Because you cannot study waste to energy at the strategic level without including everything that will be affected either upstream of the process or downstream of the process. So in this uh, research project, we looked at the entire uh, management plan from collection. Uh, so what type of separation has to be there? Keeping in mind that at that time, the UE had only one bin system. So they have everything dumped in the same uh, bin. Um, so, and in all the research, the research that we have, we put, of course, material recovery number one, and whatever left over, we, we, we deal with, with waste to energy uh, systems. So we uh, actually compared two systems, anaerobic digestion based system, and so to represent biochemical uh, treatment uh, or conversion, and the other one was incineration system, where you everything that is non-recyclable, you will process it in the incineration. Um, oh, no worries. All right. Um, so uh, what we included in the life cycle costing was the, uh, the of course, the capex and the opex, and uh, for the revenues we included the electricity production and tipping fees, and these are two very critical topics in the UAE and the carbon credits as well. Uh, so those are the assumptions. The electricity tariff in uh, in, uh, in in the UAE is eight cents per per uh, kilowatt hour, and the tipping fees currently is at fourteen dollars per ton. This research was based on a plan that Dubai had to double the tipping fees to twenty eight. So all of these numbers are based on that number. On the bad side, this has never been applied. It's still at fourteen dollars per ton. Um, all right, so the total energy produced uh, from the AD uh, or the anaerobic digestion strategy, uh, of course, the incineration was higher. The revenues for the incineration was higher as well. And the uh, annual GHG emissions reductions was also in the incineration as higher. So at the, at, the, at the base level, when we're comparing these two main uh, approaches of dealing with the waste, uh, the incineration actually uh, 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 yielded better results. Um, the AD technology uh, proved to be uh, not feasible, so it has a negative uh, net uh, present value. Um, and uh, I'll show you the reason why the, the, uh, the uh, anaerobic digestion did not work at that stage. Um, so the current bylaws in the UE prevents using the digestate, which is the leftover from the anaerobic digestion process, is prevented from being used as a fertilizer. And that results in disposing of all the digestate to the landfill. There is no other way of dealing with it because they don't have incineration. This is the way to do it. So, and that of course, what made the anaerobic digestion fail in every assessment that we have with the current regulations. Uh, another thing as well is the planned uh, tipping fees. As, as I said, it used to be $14 per ton, and uh, they were uh, planning to increase it to 28, which will happen when they open the waste to energy plant, of course. Um, another thing as well, we assumed uh, the public participation to be very low because we don't have any 
participation or running recycling programs in the UAE. So assume the very low number uh, or a logical number actually. Um, so we, uh, in that research, we suggested three reforms. One of them is uh, a legislative reform to actually permit the use of digestate as fertilizer. Um, that first scenario brought the AD very close to uh, uh, zero net present value, which is quite okay. Okay, that's it. Um, and there is also scenario two and three, we're asking or we checked if the old tipping fees would prevail and if there is a higher participation rate. With applying these two scenarios, we started to see more significant positive impacts and the AD became suddenly more feasible than the incineration. Now, anyone that works in the strategic assessment of waste to energy plants, they know that if you change a single number, a very small number, there is a very, it's very sensitive to not only one number, to very, to a large number of numbers. And so if you're not, if you don't know what you're doing, or if you, or if you want to promote a certain uh, approach, it's very easy to do. There is a lot of factors involved in this, in this process. So this is one thing that we learned from this uh, research. The second one was actually that you cannot have a single treatment system in a country. There isn't one solution that fits all. You have to have a hybrid system that has actually a, a, a collection of, of systems. So it's not only incinerators, it's not only anaerobic digestion or material recovery. You have to have a hybrid system of all of these together. And that led a couple of years later to a, a project that we worked on um, uh, and was published in uh, Cleaner Production um, about the multi-criteria optimization of, of the waste. So, and this is very important. So every country would have strategic priorities. So let's say I'm a country that produces energy. My least uh, interest would be to produce more electricity or more energy. Whereas uh, maybe my, my environmental performance is really low. So I want to uh, cut down my carbon footprint. Um, there isn't enough land. So my main priority would be the land. So every country would have its own uh, 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 situation and, and, and scenario. And the other problem as well is that those strategic goals would actually contradict each other. So if you want to be profitable, it's not necessarily that you will cut uh, most uh, uh, carbon emissions and so on. So you, you must have a, a type of optimization based on your priorities to see uh, the way to go in every country. And that's why in the uh, scientific research, it's very easy to, to publish a paper because every single country, if you study the strategic assessment of the waste, it has a different story, you know, because the inputs are different and the priorities are, are different. Um, so the local conditions, when I say every country uh, is different, the waste characteristics are different. The economic features, all of these numbers would flip the findings entirely of any strategic assessment. The strategic priorities, whether it's energy, financial, or, or, or uh, environmental footprint. And of course, some of them you need to optimize uh, uh, to, max, uh, to maximum, uh, like the energy and the profitability. And some of them you want to minimize like the greenhouse gas emissions. So in this, uh, 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 a paper as well, and uh, we identified the different waste streams because you have to split them down. Recyclables, non recyclables, ready biodegradable, and waste processing byproducts, which is a very key uh, part of the equation as well, especially with uh, biochemical conversion uh, systems. The management facilities that we uh, designed the algorithm to choose from was the material recovery facilities, anaerobic digestion, incinerators and sanitary landfills with gas recovery. So we uh, tested that algorithm that we uh, developed uh, over a 20 year assessment period for the UAE. And we uh, stated three different objectives. So let's uh, uh, do the optimization. If our main and only concern is the energy recovery. The second one, if we just want to cut the carbon footprint to the minimum, and the third one, if we just want to have a profitable 
uh, business out of it. Um, the, 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 the most interesting part of this research work was the multi-objective uh, optimized strategy. And this is the most realistic because uh, typically you would have to do all of them, but with different importance depending on your country and your situation. So for that, we use the fuzzy AHP uh, methodology to collect expert opinions, to prioritize the different objectives. So I'll walk you through the objectives one by one, and I'll, I'll show you how when we incorporated all the objectives, the findings came completely um, uh, different from the ones. So the first objective, number one, if you want to have energy recovery, maximum energy recovery, with no regard of the cost, with no regard of the environmental footprint, then put everything, uh, of course, uh, use both, uh, both technologies. The biodegradables should go to the anaerobic digestion plant and the non-recyclables would go to the incineration and the rejects of the MRF would go also to the incineration. So this is the technology that yielded the highest uh, energy uh, yield, okay? These are numbers over 20 years because uh, uh, they are excessively high, of course. Um, as I said, um, this is from the energy side. In the objective number two, when we wanted the least carbon footprint, things changed uh, a bit. So the recyclables uh, were supposed to go to the MRF and the biodegradables and the non-recyclables would go to incineration facilities because of the biogenic carbons, of course. So that's why it, it yielded the, last, the least carbon footprint. So uh, the second system would be entirely incineration, no AD uh, in there, because the, the digestate that comes out from the digestion process would have a high footprint, depending on how you're going to use it. Um, so these are the total GHG emissions compared to the landfilling. So with landfilling over the study period, 170,000 uh, tons of uh, carbon uh, emissions, and for the, uh, the the strategy that was optimized, it dropped down to 3,000 tons uh, CO2. As I said, again, this objective is regardless of the cost and the energy that comes out from the system. Um, the third objective was the profitability. So you want to make uh, uh, the highest net present value of a project. And with that, surprisingly, the incineration disappeared. Now, this is not against incineration, of course, but this is to tell you that every objective would yield a totally different result than, than the other. Um, so the multi-objective optimization, as I said, we put relative importance for every strategy. We ask experts that will see the energy mix of the country, number one, they will see the availability of other types of fuels, the environmental performance of the country and the targets. Uh, so if they have certain targets to achieve and the availability of investment funds, each one of these will change the relative importance of those contradicting or not necessarily contradicting objectives. I have to go faster. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> You're happy with it. So for the UAE, because of the conditions of the UAE, the highest importance was for the financial profitability. Why? Because they have a high energy, uh, um, uh, I mean, they, they, they are rich in oil and other sources of, uh, of energy. And also because as, as an unannexed country, they don't have any uh, um, uh, targets. Uh, well, they have expectations, of course, and they have initiatives, but they are not obliged really to uh, meet those uh, uh, um, levels. So the experts told us that for the UAE, very specific case, these are the set of uh, uh, the relative importance of the different strategies. And, and uh, we, uh, as, as our friend Daniel said, uh, it, it, the, 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 the proposal was to actually send the biodegradables to anaerobic digestion plants. The good thing about this uh, algorithm is that it actually look at the years of the assessment. So it would tell you that, for example, after 14 years, you have to have the extra readily uh, um, biodegradables sent to the landfill. Again, this is not lovely when, uh, of course, uh, environmentally, but as I said, environmentally had the one of the lowest 
So only 34% and uh, financial profitability is 46%. So applying this uh, optimized scenario, uh, you, uh, the waste to energy can achieve uh, almost 4% of the total energy demand during the 20 years. Um, it will cut 97% of the current emissions and it will improve the profitability of the national strategy by three times compared to the existing one. And so after, uh, uh, three or four years of working on the strategic assessment and optimization, we had this um, knowledge, those uh, many spreadsheets and small tools and programs. Uh, and, and we thought that it, it, it would be really nice to put them all together in, in a software that will actually uh, automate this entire process. As I said, changing one parameter will alter everything. And we wanted to make it as automated as possible to reduce the load from our side. And so we developed, uh, uh, this is the initial uh, uh, name of the software, but we're gonna change it. Uh, the, the software is composed of uh, three modules. One, the input database, and it would do two things. It would do assessment. Now, all of these are at the strategic level. So it would do strategic assessment, and it would do also multi-objective optimization. Now, the idea is to preserve raw materials, of course, and uh, generate renewable energy and increase waste diversion. I'll, I'll skip the, uh, the, the, the mission and vision. You know, uh, we want a user-friendly software. Now, those are very key uh, points. So uh, the, the software has a database of 200 countries. It has all the uh, waste-related composition and generation rates of 200 countries. It has inside it, uh, 30 different strategies to manage the waste, employing uh, waste to energy. Uh, the good thing as well, that it splits the waste into eight different streams. Um, all the calculations are based on the World Bank, the IPCC guidelines and, and the literature. So it's all uh, referenced in the manual. And as I said, it would do two types of calculations. One of them assessment, so it would calculate the life cycle costing, the carbon footprint, the energy production, and the land requirements of any combination of uh, inputs you put. And at the end, you are allowed to switch to another mode where you do optimization. Now, we have two types of optimization. Single one, where you have one objective to meet, or multi-objective, and those you will have to put different uh, uh, relative importance ratios. Uh, this is the uh, the architecture of the system, uh, starting from the user interface. I'll I, I think I will show you the software in a second. We cannot run it uh, uh, for some reason uh, here in China, but uh, I'll show you the 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 first half of it, the inputs and the results of two different uh, runs. Um, those are the uh, thirty different strategies because when you put all the alternatives together all the options, you end up with so many uh, strategies. Um, the, the facilities that we have at the beta version right now is uh, those four facilities. Um, the byproducts are the digestate and ash and the uh, MRF rejects. And uh, the possible fates of byproducts, it's either to landfill it or to incinerate it or to market it. Uh, I'll actually switch to the software if I can. Give me a second. So uh, this is the, uh, the the where you see your scenarios. So let's say let's say we pick anyone. Edit strategy. These are the inputs part of the the the, the software. So where you uh, you have different. Uh, categories or sectors that you have to, to cover. So for the general one, you choose your country from the list. It populates all those inputs, the growth rate of the population. When do you want to start the assessment period and so on? Then you switch the waste characteristics and you choose your waste. And for every type of waste, you either use the default values or you change the values for the characteristics of the waste, including the stoichiometric parameters, everything. 
if you don't have uh, enough information about this, you can use the default values. Um, and then you pick the strategies. So you have those 30 strategies and each one of them, when you choose it, it will um, show you the different options, of course. Management facilities, for every facility, you have to put uh, information. You can use this, uh, the, the brief mode or the more detailed inputs as well. The financial parameters of each strategy. And at the end, if you want to do optimization, you can choose not to do it, but you can choose. And if you choose, you have to indicate what is the relative importance of each strategy. So those are the inputs. Um, uh, the good thing about it is that when you create that scenario, it's very easy to change. You can go right away here. And uh, let's say if I change my glass or my metal uh, plus or minus 1% or 2%, how things will change. You just run it and it works perfectly. Um, on the on the results side, I'll show you one that will have all the assessment. Maybe Egypt. Yeah. So for every facility you see, they, it calculates the land requirements, the greenhouse gas emissions, the energy, uh, and so on, the tipping fees, the capital cost, and so on. Every one of them. And here you have a summary of all. The inputs you can export in Excel, you can export uh, plots, everything. Um, I'm good in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'll just put my email so that if anyone is yeah, interested. Yeah, yeah. And okay. uh, by that, I reached the end of uh, of my presentation. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask me. And. Uh, <laughs> my two emails, if you want to communicate. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mohammed Abdullah. Very great presentation. Thank you so much for sharing very valuable data. Thank you. And the software is something yes. very good. You know, thank, uh, by the way, we, we had a testing with uh, Dr. Wang and, uh, and uh, Professor Mohammed regarding the, the software. I could say it's very, very, very important. And we, I think we need to collaborate all together as, uh, as WHRT members uh, to collaborate together and put yes. that out and eventually you know we could even promote as a uh, papers we can of present course. papers yeah yes. right and also we can even include some industries to get involved with that yes yeah so thank you so much and uh i'm gonna let the attendees if they have any questions yeah dr hani yeah You reminded me about the young years which I lived in UAE. <laughs> this is 20 years yeah. ago. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, speaking about these models, uh, they should have some uh, limitations and constraints. You cannot uh, generalize them for to be applied in di different countries without considering the local circumstances there. And even within the same country, you should have certain uncertainty in applying. And uh, that's why we are talking about, we need to know such models, which to which parameters are sensitive. You, if we change the tipping fee, everything will go upside down. Exactly. Like when you said for AD, for example, at the beginning incinerator was, Winning. better yeah. now we changed one parameter everything became yes. this is one issue which we need to consider here and by using all this ahp models you we used it with anna also in our paper yes. sometimes the judgment of the expert is not that consistent exactly. how did you make sure that uh, it is consistent and not affecting the judgment because we are soliciting the opinion of experts um, in this regard. This is an excellent question because as you said, those numbers would flip the entire findings. Uh, for the expert opinions, I always use the Delphi method. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it or not, where you actually, after you do, you do the collection of the expert opinions in rounds. So after each round, you share the average of all uh, the, the survey to every participant 
and that helps uh, narrow down the differences between the experts who are not very uh, aware of a certain question or, or whatever. So, and we use fuzzy AHV as well to account for the uncertainty. Uh, so that's a good choice. And as you said, Dr. Hani, every one of us who worked on the strategic assessment has those tools in hand. You know, he has those, uh, his own spreadsheets and, 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 and what we wanted to do is to put all of them together in one integrated tool that we can all use and compare. And uh, one of the, uh, because I lived 10 years in Canada, I have tried to apply the software in Canada. It's impossible to deal uh, with Canada as one country. Every single province would have, not even a province, a city. And that's a good thing also about the software that you can work in different levels. And uh, because it's automated, you can run for the every city in the world if you have the inputs, of course, uh, and, and, you get, uh, and you get the results. And, and, and we discussed that as well to be part of, 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 of a paper that we do with, with the council to actually assess or to optimize the waste to energy uh, projects in the entire world. Uh, to see really if we optimize for every single country how how things will improve in terms or what are the investments needed or maybe what is the profit that we can get and so on perfect good so thank you so much uh mohammed and uh definitely we're gonna work on this <laughs> okay and by the way uh as you may know that you know uh the cop 28 will be held in the emirates we're gonna nominate Professor Mohammed as our amb ambassador of WTRT. Okay. <laughs> okay, perfect. Good. So uh, we're going to move. Yeah. So we're going to move to our uh, next uh, speaker, uh, which is represent uh, WTRT India. Uh, I'm calling, yeah, Mr. Arun Sawat. He's going to present the opportunities uh, for waste management business in India. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm here uh, from India, uh, Professor Savant. I was a professor of chemistry in the University of Mumbai, uh, in affiliated institution, which has been the leading institution for research in India. And uh, I was a pro vice chancellor, the vice president of the university. And then I was a president of the university at uh, Rajasthan, the pink city, that many of you must be knowing. Uh, I actually am in what I, I, my studies in my teaching research was nuclear chemistry. Then uh, in the process, we developed a lot of environmental issues, understanding. And so we are first in country, India, to do monitoring of toxic trace elements. Now, how that connects me with the West to energy Later on, when we started talking about waste to energy globally, I realized the issue is more serious of toxic metals, including the waste to energy plants. But before that, we were monitoring the water bodies in India, particularly Mumbai city. And uh, we knew the pollution in the creek, coastal side, and the rivers around, which are fetching water to the city of Mumbai. So huge, large studies of environmental sciences, inorganic NLD chemistry connected with the waste management as also. Now, when I joined uh, WTRT, we have the organization in India is an NGO, not a professional business body. Our job is taken from the advice of uh, uh, families and Thanos Bartholis. And when they came to India, we established an MOU between Columbia University and India chapter, but we are supported uh, technically to some extent by the National Environmental Engineering Research Institute that is called NIRI, an uh, apex body in India, which is in charge of any development projects which has relations with environmental issues. So this is how we work in India. But when I came to this and having studied nuclear chemistry, I am well versed. I was talking about it yesterday. How serious was the nuclear waste management uh, across the globe? We had serious issues of waste management, of nuclear waste management, right from Manhattan projects to processing, extraction of uranium, processing, then fission. And after fission, people thought everything is over, but then the light fraction, heavy refraction, uh, long-lived, short-lived isotope, 
was a big issue and it was struggled for many decades right from the fission of the neutron 32 and then plants coming into nuclear power stations and nuclear waste management the regulatory authorities iea vienna for the entire world and no plant in this world can operate without the regulations being followed of iea vienna so i know you are the intense sentence were handling but a few isotopes smallest concentration at ppm or ppt level can make a catastrophe in environment and human life so you can't afford to have nuclear waste in the environment i will not go deep into that and my point is to draw the parallel how it has been now standardized the waste nuclear waste concentrated i can say the redu reduction in volume to the minimal they are not in tons very few grams are required to run the reactor only operational criticality how to manage so there are no explosions and so having that science stabilized the nuclear waste are ultimately concentrated in a smallest volume and put into canisters buried deep down in the soil and even earthquake cannot break them so no chance of getting nuclear waste into the environment and it will be not affect in the public life at all so i wish sometime we also in the process of voluminous waste being generated across the planet and we need to take care of that this is equally dangerous because we have the cases of say minamata disease and many other metal toxicities see this is not moving go by this okay now coming back to the indian scenario the waste generation is going on we are no less than the population of china and china has over i think close to 900 waste to energy plants in addition to many other facilities in india why it is not again that we have very few so waste management business starting now but the technology of waste management is very new maybe 20 years old only in india so why why the problem the lack of awareness lack of collection segregation at source india becoming ground for the e waste because industrially we are good developing i am mean developing and economic growth also is not bad so a lot of productions are taking place but unlike china we have been not able to take care of the waste because there are many apprehensions coming from the government authorities see in my province there are 28 corporations mumbai alone is generating 8 to 10000 tons per day municipal solid waste which is being dumped at the devna or one of the suburb almost the midst of the city famous ill famous rather devna dumping ground we call legacy waste of 124 years and now with the great struggle analysis and all those we convince the corporation like mumbai municipal corporation now they are going into waste management and first plant is being set there now so we don't have waste to energy plant for city like mumbai also except that one dumping has been closed scientific closure very successfully industrial waste being managed adjoining city of the mumbai now you see the quantity now the rate is going up so currently 160000 tons per day municipal solid waste is being generated in india currently this is and it will increase to much higher i am inviting this attention i am sure the growth of business will not be at this speed at this speed and so composition of dry waste organic inert and recyclable even this is not happening it is beginning to happen so main focus is on reduction at source recycling reuse but the response from public by and large the discipline segregation of dry and wet waste also is not getting a good response in a metropolitan cities also and therefore our biggest problem is this and so ultimately it is a landfilling 
and composting. Composting started at advanced locality management levels in the city. A lot of voluntary organizations have been handling some waste and that is not all able to take care of our problems. So the energy plants are out to come. Now, the calorific value. You can see this, we get in the range of this. We have only 14 of which eight are non-operational. So please listen to these the failures. So what we are talking about waste to energy, we have many co conferences, awareness, industry tycoons, and those who are operating and some of them have failed. So this is how WTRT, I say, come to some standard operational levels. In fact, we're contemplating about the temperature required for combustion. You saw talking about 850, 950, 1050, where I question that when the combustion can take place of any carbonaceous material, 700, 800 degree, and then why do you have elevated temperature so high, which is a loss of energy? So question comes of efficiency also and economic viability also. So we have these, uh, I would say, now a nuclear power plants were hardly 10 to 11. The major generation of energy is from the coal, almost 50%. Then there are other non-conventional sources. But now if we go into this, it, it can take care of a lot of nuclear power plants coming into where we do not have Uranium reserves we have to import, and again the risk of managing plants, permissions, IEA, VN, and all those. So if you collect the energy from the waste generated from India, it could be equivalent to 300 nuclear power plants of 235 megawatt electrical per plant. This is standard establishment of nuclear power station across the world. Now they are going to 500 also, maybe going to 1,000 also. So technologies available in India, it's not that, uh, I mean, some people have been trying, they're marketing uh, many components, machinery, equipment. So composting, biomethanation, RDF, gasification, people have been trying, but there's no great success leading to proliferation of this business. Except one industry, the major player of cement industry, ACC, the most standard company, they have been using the clinkers, this RDF. Beyond that, there is no successful example. Now you can see the scope. This is something like 15,000 to 20,000. All these major cities in Uttar Pradesh, in Maharashtra, these states, right? Tamil Nadu, the South. These are four metropolitan cities, Bombay, Delhi, Calcutta, and Chennai, for Madras earlier. Now, they are the generator of such a huge, I am talking about the state-wise, not the city-wise. City-wise also you can get the data. And the geor this is geographical distribution of, and you know the many of these cities are very well-known international cities. See, this is a scenario right in Mumbai till two, three years before. I am sure it is still now, the plant is yet to be operational. And a good number of novels are coming out from writers. The West Cast of Mumbai is dumped there, the legacy waste, and three generations have been living on a West Cast. When we analyzed, monitored, did environmental monitoring, we found that average life has come down to 50 55. So we, WTRD, impressing upon the government that we, there is no other option but to take care of this waste. And it's not in one city, all the cities. And so doing business, industry, Mumbai is a worldwide known industrial hub. But then looking at the waste management, not only that, all this from these and other industries, ETP, ETPs, the water qualities of rivers around in the creek has gone really bad. We produce nearly 25 to 30 PAD thesis from my department. All studying all this from pollution levels, COD, BOD, right up to the toxic trace element, bioaccumulations, and toxicity. The large evidence that nothing is good over there now. And so these qualities have to be improved. And so all these cities, say 36% cities out of 22, 
they generate more than 1,000 tons per day. Ahmedabad, the city of Honorable Prime Minister, Delhi, Greater Mumbai, Jaipur, Rapping City, Kanpur, Lucknow, Pune, and Surat. Daniel is going to have some operations in Pune. I'm told, yes, good, please go ahead. We'll support. 50% of them out of this, they generate less than this. Anyway, the generation is too high per day and we need to take care of this. So business has to come. So India is the world's second largest population, 1.46 billion, okay, is it? 2011 census, and we're competing with China, almost close to that. But then against that, our attention to the waste management is very poor. So they are piling up. And what happens? People keep shouting, smell, stinks, land is lost. Their water, groundwater is contaminated, bore wells, wells are contaminated. So the radar, this is a very serious issue in India. I was talking to the other day whether we can have the status like or recognition from UNDP, like IEA Vienna regulation nuclear power station, should we not regulate the waste generations on this planet? When you talk of G20, Net Zero 2070, so many guidelines of 2010, 30, 40 are getting over almost what happens to CFCs? All these guidelines, declarations by UN, they should have connotations from other expert agencies and bodies, not only IPCC. So I think we should contribute to UNDP also, our sense of input, because this is not going to stop the base generation. And so we should be heard before making declarations. Then this is usual thing, hazardous waste, Plastic waste, biomedical waste, e-waste. Now, laws are coming into the force. At least hospitals have been forced to manage nuclear waste. No radioisotopes from nuclear medicine should go into the any kind of open environment. There are incinerators for biomedical, which also we force to shift out of the city because we monitor study that also under environmental studies. And so this is uh, very important. But e-waste, a lot of small units are coming up. Plastic waste management, a lot of other uh, units are coming up. They're extracting oil, making, marketing. And so this business of e-waste and that of uh, uh, oils from plastic is growing. That's a good sign. Now, the city-wise analysis, those who are interested that we city we can try to enter and have a business as the consultant advisors and getting into the partners to set up the industry in India. We, WTRT, with support from Colombia, we're going to advocate this and impress upon the central government that you, there's no need to talk of G20 net zero unless you do this decarbonization. You know how much coal India is being burning? And they proudly say 700 million tons extracted last year. In the month of May, I called a conference with the countrywide heads of coal bed methane and mine methane, which has got 84% higher potential methane as a GHG. So that emission coming from coal mines is very serious. It's a very, again, a global issue. So countries which have been using the coal as a energy source, major energy source, flash is a different. IEA worked on the flash also 20 years before. How to dump the flash, how to take care of that. And a flash are not that as clean and as you know, they can have radioisotope also like holmium, which is carcinogenic. So IEA worked very strong on that. With RM power, we were working on monitoring flash in India. Now we did find, yes, this flash cannot be used for any other purposes, no brick making, nothing, but slowly, that slogan is diluted and flash is quietly used in many operations or making building materials. For want of time, I'll run a little faster. I won't have privilege like Abdullah. <laughs> I hope I get it. So, unless it's important because, but he had a very good presentation and that of uh, 
development model and i'm sure is very useful to all of us so potential of urban solid waste you can see how much is this and india has over ulbs urban local bodies you can imagine country wide how much is waste is generated major constraint faced by the indian waste to energy sector waste to energy is just a decade old concept in india and uh, most of the proven and commercial technologies in respect of urban waste were required to be imported and that was our main you know nuclear power plants also we have the exhibitions and then sorry waste to energy Two decade. This one. ULBs, urban local bodies, the corporations, mega cities, major cities, major. We have the governance system, the gram panchayat village level, then uh, municipal car, uh, municipality, the larger city, and the one which has got population more than five lakh. Is called urban local body, where the fast urbanization taking place. <laughs> so ULB is that is a short form that we use there. So again, lack of financial resources with ULBs and LBs is local body. The gram panchayat, smallest village panchayat. I hope you understand. There are no money for taking the waste, taking care of the waste. So these are the constraints, and so laws after law we have been promulgating. And now 2016 law, very stringent, like air pollution, water pollution, and nuclear waste, I mean, pollution. So this is very important that 2016, there are mandate given to all ULBs, municipal corporations, the big cities, that they must establish the facility for waste management, but nothing is happening. No bureaucrat is punished for not having this. And look at the pittance, the tariff, which also the generator, <laughs> and distributor and the consumer. There's a fight lying in Delhi city also. So we made, WTIT made a petition uh, with the electricity body, uh, regulatory authority at Delhi, asking for to for, give compliance to the declaration of parliament to give better price. But even that is not happening. But I'm sure the things are changing now. Now, Hitachi has a good business now coming up. Globally, they are strong, but they are also trying to. And some of these, you know, the engineering companies have their centers, maybe for Indian plants to come or near about in other neighboring countries. That they have the storehouse in uh, India, and where there it is being supplied to the other cities. So the waste cranes, cone cranes, are very famous. All the plants now, almost all operating cone crane, and. Uh, for pulverization also, it is used, reducing moisture. Hitaji Sozin has taken a lot of lead into this. So these are all companies. So those who want to come to India in the waste management business and the industry, yes, there is there is the availability of the material. These are successful projects fairly. I said out of tailwater 14, uh, only eight are successful operational. There are a lot of hiccups. But now these 600, 1350, 1200, 1200 tons per day, these projects are, you can see this uh, SL is an industry. They are in fact in a media business, but they came into this. At Jabalpur, uh, northern state of the country, they established this plant. At Okhla, that is Delhi, Tikamport Okhla plant, those of you in this must be uh, knowing and visited also. Ghazipur, that is Delhi. But a lot of mess again there, you know, managing that also become difficult. Ramki Delhi projects is now fairly good operational. And the same one, this is Jabalpur. Now, in addition to this, we can imagine that is also clearance of the land. Uh, one million dollar for one acre, one hectare in Mumbai. The cost of land, the costless Probably worldwide, I do not know. And 332 hectare is occupied by legacy waste. The so corporation want to set up land. So we say probably they want to clear the land 
and the corporation get good amount of money. So clearing the land, not only here, the worldwide also, but those plants which have been set up, we can see this, a community waste throughput in metric tons. Against that, the energy generation peak also is good. So conditions, moisture, segregation, calorific values come to an agreement. So incremental addition, use of the solid waste, you have the incremental output. So I can assure that technically it is getting stabilized. And so that uh, each plant is handling so much quantity, say average load factor is 95 90%. And the consistency, they don't have to struggle for the resources or the material. No plant can go dry because the continuous flow of the waste generated and there is more and more urbanization, I would say in Mumbai or India, it is fastest. So many people from villages, jobs and other, when they have a job, they bring families. So urbanization is a very on a very fast track in the entire country because villages, there are no good infrastructure. People want to migrate to the city. Agriculture avenues are not so good because most of the crops are rain fed. And so the vagary of the nature can lead to so much damage, floods, they're very frequent. And so people do have migrations. So Indian Oil Corporation, the amazing major oil company, they have gone into for a very successful biomethanation also. You can see this diagram. So even that is for that machinery and all that, uh, things are available. So Swachh Bharat initiative, you must be saying, seeing that our prime minister, the mission he took three, four years before. Swachh means clean India. So at least they started collecting garbage, you know, and uh, cleaning the streets and big camp in one minute. And so, but we're asking the technocrats, after collection garbage, what next? Please promote extra energy business in India. So this is how it's happening. So prospective of uh, WT market in India is good. Shared technology in the waste management are good. Uh, India waste management industry overview. Some players are there inside now. Business opportunities waste to energy sector. You can see the large enough. The cumulative aggregate waste generation is also on the rise. And there is value chain. So many other ancillary business in India, they required for employment also. So this employs so many people and right from recycling, collection, segregation, separation, there is ancillary business. And so energy recovery, all those issues are very important. So my appeal to all here, to have your eye on the setting the business in India, on waste management, you know, whatever technology format it is, not necessarily reverse to waste to energy, but biomethanation, composting, and uh, many other uh, associated business and industries, recycle recovery. So with this, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Aaron, stay with me. Just, just stay with me with the question. Yeah. Thanks so much, Aaron, for your presentation. Very interesting. Thanks for uh, for your time and joining the the, our congress and i'm asking the attendees if uh, you have uh, any questions for uh, aaron he's uh, available for you yeah professor Wong. you mentioned the so it's approximately 68 million pounds per year. Yes, 68 million pounds per year. Yes, you're right, because China's fast industrialization, the growth is phenomenal. You produce everything, I export everything, and you are taking care of the waste. That's the only formula. Why? In that, we are good in heavy industries, steel plants, cements, fertilizers. But other ancillary industries, we generate a lot of plastics, components, or other materials, cardboards, furnitures, is less. That is why that ratio is much less compared with China. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. Any question? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Hurtari. Yeah. Mika. Okay. I give you my. There we go. Thank you for, for your presentation. So what do you see the main bottleneck of, of the development of municipal solid waste? Is, is it the, <clears throat> or uh, yeah, is there enough uh, gate fees for treatment or or uh, money coming to the process by the waste producers or what, what is the? Very good questions. First is apathy of the government officers in the government corporations their attentions are somewhere else, not uh, the waste management. Second, the people can tolerate. Tolerance level is very high, unlike developed countries. You can spoil the rivers, sites of the complex of the residential colony, stings and all that. If they have gone for a systematic closure of one of the western suburbs of Mumbai, when people came with the big agitations. So this is a scientific closure, the problem is solved. Similarly here also. So. Uh, public response or awareness, those who are suffering only come forward. Government apathy, subsidies, incentives are not easy to come. Now, these problems we have been focusing on, some resolutions are happening, new government regulations are coming. So, that is the main bottleneck. Thank you. Any question? Okay, so we're going to move to the next speaker. Thank you. So just uh, just to let you know that uh, yeah yes so uh, Aaron we are as you mentioned we uh, we we are very uh, um, we're gonna continue our collaboration you know as we renew our corporate cooperation you know we we sign in an MOU so we can support uh, WTRT India you know to advance the waste energy technologies and also with the with the leadership of Professor Huang I'm sure he can add a strategy. <laughs> Okay, so our next speaker, uh, let me introduce our next speaker. So, uh, Mr. Daniel Sindisich, he represents, he's a CEO, president of Lara Group, representing WTRT Brazil. He's going to present for us uh, today a, a case project regarding uh, Mao waste energy combining uh, biogas. So, the floor is yours, Daniel. I have tried training to say these uh, things, but uh, you can read. I, I, you don't have a problem to read, but hey, so, so I'm very proud to be here and thank you very much for this invitation. It's okay, everybody can hear me? Okay, good. So first of all, thank you very much, professor. And I should also to thank you all your students. They are very fantastic people. It's uh, very nice to, to meet these guys here. So, <clears throat> this is a short curriculum about myself. So I have been uh, I don't know. I have this paper because I, I took a lot of notes during your presentation. Uh, I think I think there is an issue regarding the loud. Yeah, if you could speak a little bit loud, so basically we can hear you very well. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. Ah, thank you. So. <clears throat> Let me go fast because Reda have asked me to move on fast. Um, but one thing I would like to start is uh, with the book I wrote about uh, management of waste in Brazil. It's in Portuguese, but um, I think many issues that insight would be useful for uh, for professor, so this is a gift from my side. Thank you very much. And, okay, this is for you. Spanish? <laughs> yes, in Portuguese. <laughs> but uh, the the numbers, I can see. I, I, you can understand. Yeah, but that's okay. 
Thank you. <clears throat> so let, let's move on. Okay. Okay, Lara is a private company, is a family company. Uh, they exist more than 14 years and uh, mainly uh, managing in landfills. So why is that is important? Because normally the group of landfill or the family of landfill in Brazil are not very familiar with the waste to energy. Uh, more than that, they have some restriction because they believe they go to lose their business if the waste to energy come to uh, uh, to the uh, to Brazil. <clears throat> so this was a this have been a very hard work to Abren in Yuri to show to the the government that the best way to manage waste in Brazil is uh, waste to energy and not uh, not uh, landfills. Okay. I don't work. Oh, I work. Oh, okay. So you also involved with, with uh, sanitation water, and uh, we are located in several states of uh, Brazil, in São Paulo, Minas Gerais, Rio de Janeiro, uh, uh, Espírito Santo, and uh, in uh, Paraíba. That is a very uh, northeast of uh, Brazil. So we have a more than nine landfills. And also you are together with a partner in India, uh, managing the landfill and the most important landfill in Mumbai. Uh, and uh, now we also have a waste to energy plant that have been inaugurated a few months ago. Uh, this um, uh, plant can produce 14 megawatts. So <clears throat> here is some uh, important authorities of Brazil that we have been working with them. The first one, I don't know if you know about her, he's a um, uh, minister of environmental, very famous around the world because he's come from uh, Amazonia. And uh, that man there is the <clears throat> vice president of Brazil. So they are in our side to understand the the concept of the our our plant. So this is a movie that I did it, or I normally I use it in some presentation. We have expected uh, many expected how to or different arguments to convince uh, to change the management of the world. Uh, national technical education as I mentioned, all of us have a discussion about this. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think this this represents. You now it's clear for everybody that is really arming. You know, so uh, water have been a problem, energy have been a problem, contamination of soil was a problem. We can use all these uh, uh, arguments and this correct argument that was presented by my colleagues this uh, morning. But also, uh, that was not treated until now, logistic is also a problem because many landfill, they have a, a fixed um, lifetime of operation. So here in the case of Sao Paulo, uh, they have a study that shows that many landfill that is, um, okay, and this, we have different color in this map that shows that this dark color is where you have landfill in operation that uh, will stop or the lifetime you will finish in two or five years. So, so the state of Sao Paulo is one of the most important states in Brazil. And uh, when you're talking about the generation of waste, this country is, is uh, one of the most contributors of the waste. So 
uh, <clears throat> logistics is something important too, because if one of these landfill uh, stop their operation, means uh, that the waste have to travel far away, and this costs a lot of money. So our landfill is in Mawa, is a city called Mawa, and he's, they are responsible and receive uh, waste from 10 different cities. Uh, we have a cities on this, uh, the border that to travel around 150 kilometers to, uh, to our landfill, to dispose their waste to our landfill. So it's very important to us to move on and looking for uh, new technology and not only depend on uh, the landfills. Otherwise, uh, we go to bring a lot of troubles for all these regions. We are talking about more than 4 million habitants depend of this uh, landfill. So when Lara decided to go forward to a new technology, uh, we start to visit many plants around the, the world. We start to talk with different uh, suppliers of technology, different technology, EPC, et cetera. And also we uh, joined with a partner in India to be an investor, one of uh, the plant, that's plant is called uh, Puni. That was already mentioned by our colleague here. And on the goal, So, as you can see, it was mentioned by uh, our colleague. Uh, they needed this area for uh, residence. So now, in August, we have inaugurated the plant. <laughs> So that was also important for us to, to gain this uh, knowledge. So <clears throat> uh, our concept uh, is using biogas. You got to understand uh, here we had. So <clears throat> we start to discuss direct with the suppliers of the technology. In this case, Baumgart. After many discussions with different suppliers like Itachi, Kinin, uh, <clears throat> Kepel Seeger, then we move to Baumgart because they are more open to have a clear and open the technology because we would like to be involved in the discussion of the concept. So then we have visited Germany many times and then also came to Brazil to visit it, uh, the place and the suppliers to understand what could be uh, uh, built in Brazil or what we have to import. So one of these discussion was about uh, the <clears throat> superheaters. We know that uh, what uh, one of the limitation of waste to energy is the superheaters. You have to work in uh, below 400 degrees Celsius due to the, the, the corrosion. And well, and I, need, I don't need to go deeply because I'm sure you are very uh, familiar with this uh, situation. But one of my visit in, fi in Finland, in Ula, uh, I see one of their plants with an equipment uh, uh, nearby the plant. So then I asked, what was this? They, they said that was, um, a superheater, they are using syn gas to burn inside of these superheaters. So as I said, well, this is very interesting. I am in a, in a landfill that I have a biogas. Why not to use the biogas instead of uh, burning these in the flare? So this have a lot of advantage because first of all, <clears throat> you can uh, increase your temperature because then the superheater will not have contact with this uh, anymore with the gas with this temperature that can destroy uh, due to the corrosion. <clears throat> Another issue, so once you, you, you have um, the superheat out, 
means you can work and you can uh, 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 have your maintenance stop uh, a few months more than uh, normally in a typical plant with the superheating internal superheater works normally is in around the nine nine months or 12 months uh, normally it's necessary to stop the plant for one month for maintenance and come back it's because of the normally the bottleneck is the the superheater so another issue be, uh, once we have uh, thinking to to use this uh, concept we have to remember once we stop to dumping the waste in the landfill one day we're not going to have any more the biogas so that was also important to the, to understand how will be uh, the production of a biogas during the time <clears throat> so the the concept was based to treat 3000 ton per day in this landfill normally we receive uh, around um, 3.5 thousand uh, uh, tons per day so we decided to to go through a 3000 so in that uh, because of that we have to have three lines in parallel <clears throat> so another uh, problem that was uh, already discussed discussed here by Muhammad is about finance issues whatever you decided is always in the end of the day finance decide well, if you go or not through uh, your decision so <clears throat> We we see we saw that um, uh, we have um, a high humidity moisture on our uh, waste around fifty percent. So then we decided to think why not to dry a little bit this and then reduce the mass. So together with a company in Germany, we have developed this uh, kind of uh, MBBG plant to dry naturally. Uh, the waste. So the waste come in, and uh, two or three weeks after, like, we have the waste out with uh, less uh, moisture, with a higher uh, heat uh, heat value. Uh, so this also was um, something interesting in the concept. So because of that, uh, we could reduce it. Uh, uh, three lines in two lines in parallel because we could remove 1,000 uh, tons of water of our, our waste. So another advantage, when you keep out the water, you have less volume of gas. So then the, even your boiler and flue uh, gas treatment also reduce the size so you can uh, reduce your capex. So the first calculation ever line the magic number for 1000 is around 100 million dollars uh, and uh, a plant like that for mbt plant will cost around 40 million dollars so we can save 60 million dollars so it makes sense to go through uh, this concept the only issue is the area because this look at the, the size of the uh, mbt plant compared with the waste to energy plant but as we are Installing this in the landfill, we have enough area uh, to build. So we decide to uh, to go through this uh, concept. So these are the typical ones, like in Pune. You have um, the, the the residues go to the bunker, the burning pass pass through the the waste uh, the gas cleaning system. You produce uh, steam, you produce energy, and and so on. So, the first analysis we did it. You took the biogas, burn it in uh, the superheater, and later on, we find out that it was possible also to eliminate water from the the waste. So, <clears throat> then uh, with the mass balance, thermal balance, we realized it that. Uh, the efficiency of this plant would achieve uh, around 30%. Normally, this kind of plant uh, is around 20, 22%. So if you know a little bit about motors, you know that a motor, the efficiency of a, uh, a motor is around 25%. 
and the turbine, a gas turbine is around 30%. So it's a very interesting that we can have the same efficiency than a turbine burning a gas. But that in this case, we are burning waste. So at the end of the day, we needed uh, 19,000 square meters to install all the plant. Will be two lines. Uh, after the MEPG plant from 7.5 megajoule per kilo, we, we increased to 11. And uh, you also use an air, con uh, air condensers. <clears throat> so we don't need water on the system. So this is the, the plant. This is the time. One of our colleagues have a mention, I think, from Colombia. Uh, yeah, from Colombia. Uh, that's uh, normally one of the issues is the license that take uh, around two or four years. In Brazil, it's not different. That also took for us almost two, three years to get our license. So this plant has already the license. We have already the concept. And uh, we know already the technology that could be used here. But when you see the whole process, take much more time because we need, uh, uh, we have to include the whole studies before we go through the, the license. So normally a project take more than five years to be developed. So I did them fast as possible. And, um, but before I finish, uh, I think one of our colleagues was here, the first one, and uh, Reda make a quest, made a question. So what uh, could be done to help uh, countries that is looking for this kind of technology? I think uh, this kind of technology exists in different, in different countries because the government somehow have helped. They have invested uh, and help entrepreneur investors uh, to happen. So uh, it would be interesting to have um, a paper showing what each country was have done concerning uh, uh, supporting this kind of technology. Uh, when you see India or China or even Dubai. Um, Germany, even all these countries, somehow the government was there to help. You know? uh, it's not possible a plant like that without a, a kind of a support. So, if I could have from you uh, what China have done, what India have done officially, we can discuss with our guys too. You know, so as was mentioned by Mohamed, uh, strategy, you know, land, environmental, energy, and other issues is always important. Uh, but this is important for concept. In the end of the day, financial issues is the most important. And then political decision. If you don't have a political decision, uh, no way to, to move on forward. So, I think this was uh, what I have prepared for you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel, for your presentation. Uh, our next speaker um, is uh, Professor Dr. Hani Abordais. He represents uh, WTRT Jordan at the Jordan University of uh, Technology. And uh, he's going to present us uh, the, the potential of waste energy in Jordan the current and future uh, prospect. So, uh, Dr. Hani, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be with you today here uh, to present the status of waste to energy in my small country, Jordan which has a population of uh, 11.5 million. And I hope that everybody is still awake after this long day. Uh, so I will uh, 
tell you a joke about uh, Jordan and China when the late King Hussein arrived in a visit to Jordan, to China, uh, the Chinese president met him and asked him about the population of Jordan. This is back in 90s. And he told him it is around 2 million. So why you didn't get them with you in your visit? <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Jordan is a Mediterranean country where uh, if we talk about the uh, waste uh, and on in uh, a global level, uh, the World Bank uh, 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 expected that the annual amount will be 3.5 billion tons. And unfortunately, 40% of waste generated is not managed properly, which may uh, cause uh, the well-known environmental problems, others, uh, groundwater contamination, soil contaminations, and the most important also is the greenhouse gas uh, impact. This uh, map is showing uh, worldwide uh, trends of the waste in different regions of the world, and we can see that it is uh, despite the application of different uh, technologies, different approaches, uh, the waste is into in following an increasing trend everywhere in the world. Uh, about Jordan, as I mentioned, it is a, Mediter a Medi Mediterranean country, or it is located in the Middle East, and uh, with a territory of 89.34 kilometer, thousand kilometer. It has around 11.5 million inhabitants. We generate about 33.3 million of solid waste. Uh, mainly uh, the management of waste in the country is... Uh, Disposal driven, so 90% of the waste finds its way to the landfills and only 10% being recycled. And most of the recycling is taking place by informal sector. The, um, uh, so Jordan also as a country suffers from scarcity of natural resources. We are a poor country in terms of water and energy, more than 90% of our energy needs are imported. We are not an oil producing country, although all countries uh, surrounding Jordan having oil, but Jordan, none because they are saying the geology there is high and all our oil is seeping to <laughs> the surrounding countries. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the import was 91, and this is putting uh, a heavy burden on the national economy of the country, where we have 19% uh, of the total national budget going for the oil import. Uh, so uh, the waste to... of waste and importing considering that the uh, amount of uh, greenhouse gases emitted from the waste sector is around 12% uh, from the total. Here you have uh, the composition of the waste to energy option and physical composition of waste, we have to identify where we characterize this waste at source of generation, uh, at transfer station, at landfill. This is very important because by the time the waste reach the facilities, a lot of it can be 
uh, uh, drawn out by the scavengers, for example, uh, a lot of it cannot be collected. So we are talking here about the collection efficiency. So it's very important here to state where we have this. As you see here, as with all, uh, 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 the, as the case with uh, most of developing countries, the uh, largest fraction of the waste is organic. And this uh, gives us the opportunity to talk about waste to energy, but not thermal, biological. So as we will see now, what are the technologies applied in Jordan in waste to energy? Uh, as we mentioned that we have uh, a disposal driven approach. We are following on, only landfilling for 90% of the waste generated and we have 19 landfills covering the whole country. Uh, only two of them are sanitary landfill, la landfills, uh, engineered facilities where we have biogas extraction, we have liner, but fortunately 70% of the waste generated is going to those landfill because this one, one is absorbing 50%, uh, which is uh, nearby the capital city of Amman. It receives around uh, 4,000 tons per day. And uh, so we have this, uh, Al Ghabawi landfill here nearby Amman, and we have in the north where I am living, Al Akader landfill, where uh, also being converted to a uh, uh, sanitary landfill in the recent years. Uh, the estimated annual disposed amount is 2.8 million tons per year with an annual increase of 3% while refugees increased this amount to 10%. Jordan, uh, well-known country uh, with receiving uh, refugees from the whole region. All the conflicts in re the region reflected on the Jordan where uh, recently, for example, due to the Syrian conflict, we have got 1.5 million of refugees. Uh, so they contribute to uh, the consumption of water and the generation of uh, waste. <clears throat> the installed capacity, if we are talking about renewable energy in Jordan, and part of it is the uh, waste to energy, the installed capacity of renewable energy in 2019 was uh, 1,423 megawatt. This is according to the Ministry of uh, Energy. The national energy strategy is uh, calling for increasing the share of renewable energy to reach 20% uh, by the year 2025. And we have reached this, by the way, almost by 2020, where it is thanks to the solar energy, we reached this uh, percentage. The strategy states that the main renewable energy share in electricity generation came from solar and wind energy with share of 6%. Uh, now speaking uh, about the um, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions in Jordan, uh, as we can see the total uh, emissions from all sectors is about 32 million uh, uh, tons of CO2 equivalent from all sectors. However, energy is having 75% uh, energy sector and waste sector alone has uh, around 12%, which is relatively high. If you look at different countries, you will get six to seven percent global average, uh, seven according to IPCC, but Jordan waste sector emitting a lot of uh, 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 emissions. And this is uh, due certainly mainly to the collection process where 
uh, we have, uh, 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 for example, Amman, which is the capital city generating 50% uh, of the waste in Jordan. Uh, it has a very uh, 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 complicated topography. So the collection vehicles having emissions more than when you have a very gentle topography. Uh, the collection is contributing to this. And uh, we conducted a life cycle assessment for this and we found it specifically from this source. Uh, also, uh, so if we are talking uh, according to the fourth uh, national uh, communication report to the UNFCC, Jordan uh, um, generate 87% of 87% uh, of the emissions are coming from the waste and energy sector. So waste to energy option looks unattractive because you hit many birds by one stone, you reduce the emission, you reduce the import of oil from outside and you get a clean energy. Uh, speaking about the objective of the, the our uh, presentation here, we are talking about to assess the energetic potential of waste to energy running projects as well as the future ones, the future prospects of the energy. As we see uh, Jordan following the traditional option of uh, in waste management, uh, 90% disposed in landfills, uh, three quarter of the greenhouse gases coming from energy and waste sector. Uh, if we are talking about uh, certain um, uh, research uh, projects, we could uh, find that the calorific value of the waste in Jordan is about uh, 2,747 kilocalorie per kilogram. Uh, in case of this energy potential recovered, you will have to contribute to 6% uh, of oil consumption. This research was conducted in the year 2000, but now, nowadays the energy import is higher, so, and the waste is also increased, so maybe the same percentage remains valid. Again, we have this problem. Shall we go back? Okay. Realizing the importance of waste to energy, uh, we had several strategies. Uh, no, we can go back to the... Yeah, this one. So we have different policies and the strategies to enhance the waste to energy, and uh, most of them relevant the, to the uh, Jordan vision by twenty. 25 decrease the solid waste amount by 33% and waste to energy is one of the options. And Jordan energy strategy 2020-25, we need to in, 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 in increase this by 20%. As I mentioned, we achieved that already. And national solid waste management strategy, the government passed in the year 2015, the national solid waste management strategy, which has uh, several principles, polluters based principle, uh, the EPR and waste to energy was one of the pillars of that uh, strategy to move towards uh, the promotion of this uh, technology. Uh, landfill biogas is the main waste to energy applied in Jordan and we have uh, uh, began in 2000 the uh, a landfill nearby Amman called Rusaifa landfill, where it has been closed because of the, its problem and proximity to the 
urban areas and they started to extracting the uh, 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 way the uh, energy from it and the largest one also is in al gabawi as i mentioned which is an engineered facility designed for energy recovery with 4.8 megawatt of biogas project bot with the uh, uh, a greek company constructed it uh, Rosaifa landfill, the one which was closed also, it has 84 biogas wells with 4 megawatt uh, a closed landfill in Rosaifa. Those are the two major landfills in the country which are adopting the extraction of biogas from the landfill. The other, this is one of our uh, recent uh, studies where we estimated the potential of landfills in Jordan for uh, for energy and we found that uh, we utilized different uh, models which they applied in in estimating the uh, waste we have the land gem we have the gas sim and other types of models and as you know all these are uh, having a triangular trend where this year, the closure of the landfill, and after that, it will decline. And we found that uh, potential of 34.8 megawatt from major landfills in Jordan. Of course, we cannot apply the biogas to any landfill of any size. We have to have a certain size of landfill to recover the energy. So this energy is only from uh, five landfills from the 19th in the Jordan. But the other smaller zone, we can extract the uh, biogas for a flaring to just reduce the greenhouse emissions. Uh, the utilization could mitigate 18 million tons of CO2 between the year 2020 and uh, 2030. Uh, another uh, 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 also we use recently Jordan started applied the biogas from sludge in the wastewater treatment plant. This is the biggest wastewater treatment plant. And you can see here the digester, Al Samra wastewater, which generates 6.5 uh, megawatt from sludge in a combined heat CHP system. And the Wadi Shalala plant produces 0.58 megawatt of. Uh, electricity from the sludge. Another anaerobic digestion plant, which uh, constructed nearby the closed landfill. And here we conducted uh, a study on this plant to optimize its operation using artificial intelligence. We published uh, a paper on that uh, amount of uh, from the uh, uh, bio waste. Also, we have a potential. We still did not utilize this, which is a very important source where, which is not yet uh, utilized. So we could have about from animal manure, three, uh, three point uh, million tons and so on, uh, amount of different types of bio waste generated in Jordan. If we can utilize this, we can produce about 37 megawatt of power here uh, so the energy is estimated to be about 157,000 tons of oil equivalent from the bio waste uh, incineration is not yet used in jordan because they believe that in the absence of source segregation of the waste we have a very moist waste so it is not economically feasible to use incinerator with this high uh, content of moisture. So we have only incinerator at our university campus to use it for medical waste uh, treatment, uh, around four, three to five tons per day, medical waste. And uh, now there is a potential for these, some studies conducted and found that 50% uh, of the solid waste in Jordan is suitable for energy recovery. Uh, this is one of our uh, 
uh, early research of waste to energy, and we found that the energy content in Jordan is linearly uh, correlated with the plastic to paper ratio in this regard. Uh, another uh, paper which is uh, utilizing the uh, uh, biogas uh, production from waste digester using artificial neural network and uh, genetic algorithms. And we uh, also estimated that published it in resource conservation and recycling. Uh, this is one of our pilot projects for this closed landfill where we have two uh, wells extracted and we published that paper also uh, in for the potential of emission reduction from unsanitary landfill uh, assessment of greenhouse gas emissions and energetic potential from solid waste landfills in Jordan comparative modeling analysis where we utilize different models to assess that thank you very much and we'll be happy to answer any questions Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hani. We uh, appreciate uh, sharing uh, with us your research. Waste energy in Jordan. So uh, we're going to ask questions, but, you know, after, because we have uh, some change on the, on the, on the agenda. So we're going to include uh, three participants coming from Europe. Uh, Ms. Ella Stangler from CWEP, Professor Stefano Consoni from Italy, and Dr. Samet from, uh, from Turkey. So definitely we're gonna go back because we're gonna skip the break to allow them to, to join the, uh, our 